Hey guys, Ryan Martian here, and today I want to discuss the ending of the Coen Brothers' brilliant 1996 film, Fargo. I already analyzed the parking lot scene and Jerry Lundegaard's downfall in a previous video, and felt the need to discuss the ending in a separate analysis, because it perfectly ties together the morals and plot in a few different and laudable ways. As always, there are major spoilers ahead, but I always want to give you guys a fair warning. You have been warned. For me, the true conclusion of the film begins after Margie confronts Garrett Grimswood at the cabin on the lake and discovers the remains of his associate Carl Showalter and the body of Gene Lundegaard. As Margie is driving Gare away in her prowler, we see his dejected face reflected in the rearview mirror already behind bars. He isn't in jail yet and hasn't even gone to trial, but his freedom is long gone and Gare knows it. There is nothing he can do to fix both his and Carl's mistakes at this point. We next see Margie looking back at Gare and her face suggests both sadness and confusion, along with what even seems to be a bit of pity for the man. After she correctly deduces the identity of the dead body along with the remains of his associate in the wood chipper, she says, For what? A little bit of money. There's more to life than a little money, you know. Immediately after she says this, something catches the eye of Gare from outside the window. The camera cuts to the prowler passing the now very recognizable statue of Paul Bunyan. Earlier in the film, Gare and Carl drive past this exact same statue right before they get pulled over for the expired tags. As the result of Carl's negligence and attempt to smooth talk and bribe the police officer, the first three murders occur. That night was the beginning of the end for our antagonist, and Gare has literally come full circle. At the same time, it also served as a nice little foreshadowing device for Carl's ultimate demise. Gare turns his head back and based on his facial expression, it's now crystal clear precisely where his freedom literally and metaphorically started to crumble. Even though it's far too late now, Gare should have seen his undoing the minute they passed that omen of a statue earlier in the film. We cut back to Margie finishing her statement about a little bit of money with, Don't you know that? And reinforces it all with her final remark of, And it's a beautiful day. Well, I just don't understand it. Now, I would hardly qualify a freezing cold environment with no sunshine as beautiful, but the purpose of Margie's speech is simple and to the point. Freedom without the constant drive to obtain a little bit of money, whether legally or illegally, is truly beautiful regardless of the weather outside. Freedom can be given and taken away, and once it's gone, the world becomes bleaker and bleaker with each passing moment. She cannot fathom why someone would throw everything away simply for some ill-gotten monetary gains. We now hear sirens approaching from behind the prowler and Margie pulls over to let them by. We see two other police cars escorting the ambulance carrying Jean's body away from the scene of the crime. The way the shot is framed, along with the surrounding white environment and falling snow, is almost exactly the same as the opening scene of the film, with Jerry towing the Sierra towards Fargo and his initial meeting with Gare and Carl. This framing serves two very specific and important purposes. It shows the beginning of the kidnapping scheme and the literal results of it. Two bookends. Just like the statue of Paul Bunyan, it's yet another example of a very simple and understated framing shot by the Coen brothers and Roger Deakins. It's very easy to miss or even simply forget, because the Coens put so much detail into every aspect of their films without needing to scream these little nuances and touches into the faces of their audience. After a short crossfade, we are now in Bismarck, North Dakota at a roadside motel. We see two police officers knocking on a door and asking, Mr. Anderson? A voice inside replies, Who? In case we needed to be reminded one final time of how inept Jerry Lundergaard truly is, he already forgot the fake name he registered under. After attempting to stall for a minute, the clerk opens the door only to see Jerry attempting to escape through the bathroom window. Once he realizes he is finally caught, he starts to whine and cry like a little child who didn't get what he wanted for his birthday. He is thrown onto his disheveled motel bed and handcuffed by the police officers. It's important to note that Jerry is all alone in a small motel room wearing only his undershirt and boxers while on the run for the authorities with no family by his side. The sheets and blankets of his motel bed are a mess and chaos surrounds him. This is important because there is a sudden hard cut to Norm Gunderson sitting peacefully in his bed at home waiting for his wife Margie. The bed is neatly made, Margie has her pillows propped up and waiting for her, and the warm glow of the television is ready to guide them to sleep. It's a stark contrast from Jerry's last moments of freedom, and the hard cut was no accident. After Margie comes to bed, Norm tells her that his Mallard painting was chosen for the three cent stamp. He feigns a half smile for a moment when Margie says, You're Mallard? That's terrific. But then responds, It's just a three cent. Hauptman's blue winged teal got to 29 cent. People don't much use the three cent. Margie retorts, Oh, for Pete's sakes, of course they do. She pauses for a moment and continues, Whenever they raise the postage, people need the little stamps, when they're stuck with a bunch of the old ones. 
Now, Norm's painting was mentioned only in passing earlier in the film when he brings lunch to Margie at the police station. If it was never mentioned again, it would have been a throwaway line used to simply move the dialogue along and possibly give Norm's character a brief background. There is no such thing as a throwaway line in the Coen brothers' vocabulary, and they chose to end the entire film with this minor plot resolve. Not only does this humanize Margie and Norm's characters that much more, it also shows what is truly important and one of the main themes throughout the entire film. To support and love your partner in life, no matter how small or insignificant their trials and tribulations might appear to be. At the same time, Margie is 100% correct with her reassurance. She isn't simply placating her husband for the sake of making him feel better. His three-cent stamp, while small in a monetary sense, is significantly more valuable than the 29-cent in both its long-term use and practicality. The scene and film closes with Margie reinforcing how proud she is of Norm and telling him, you know, we're doing pretty good. They exchange I love yous and Norm, while rubbing his wife's very pregnant belly, says, two more months. Margie responds with the same, and as our two characters are lying peacefully in bed, smiling in each other's arms and looking forward to their future and family, the screen fades to black and the credit roll starts. During this entire one-shot sequence, accompanied by Carter Burwell's beautiful score fading in near the very end at just the right moment, the camera slowly zooms and focuses on Norm and Margie, along with their yet-to-be-born baby, to reinforce one final time the very serious and uplifting moral of this absurdly dark and uncomfortably funny film. As always guys, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this analysis, please drop a like or subscribe. Thanks again.